I was a young boy, I fantasized about the career I would pursue as an adult. <laughs> Airplane pilot. Being a pilot had the same cachet as the favorite careers of my playmates, police officer and firefighter. And for the same reasons. It had a uniform, it commanded authority, and it was an action job. When I was 10, my older brother and I actually built a 24-foot glider, which we took turns flying and crashing in the Black Creek Ravine in Toronto. A couple of years later, my gaze turned from airplanes to rockets, and I decided instead to be a rocket scientist. Once again, my brother and I gave concrete expression to our interest, until one of our six-foot-long space probes blew up, severely injuring a friend who tried to set it back upright when it fell off the launching pad. Nonetheless, in retrospect, I see that my dream career had already moved from doing to thinking. Throughout high school, maths, physics, chemistry were my passion, to such an extent that I studied German for three years simply because my high school physics teacher told me that most of the best work in physics was being done in that language. Then, poof, at age 17, I had an epiphany. A visit to my grade 13 class by Stokely Carmichael of the U.S. Civil Rights NGO Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee led me to toss over science completely and to study the humanities at university. Theoretical thinking in the sciences no longer seemed good enough. I decided that I needed to focus on thinking that would lead to social transformation. Four years later, I was all set to do a PhD in politics and economics. Unfortunately for my pursuit of a career as a political theorist, however, June 1968 produced another epiphany. Against the tidal wave of Trudomania, I worked on the forlorn hope campaign of NDP leader David Lewis. The experience galvanized me to see the power and the promise of law in areas of social justice and the fight against poverty. Suite à cette expérience politique, j'ai conclu que je pouvais mieux contribuer au bien-être sociétal en poursuivant une carrière d'avocat. Pendant mes études en droit, j'ai fait la connaissance de professeurs remarquables, Gérard Ledin, Harry Arthurs, Judy Lamarche. Bien que presque tous mes copains de classe étaient des hommes blancs issus de milieux socio-économiques confortables, la plupart étaient également passionnés par les questions de justice sociale. Aujourd'hui, je me réjouis de leur succès en tant qu'avocat de grands cabinets ou de petites villes, en tant que fonctionnaire, politicien, conseiller juridique auprès des ONG, activiste, professeur et de plus en plus <coughs> juge. Mais notez bien, la lutte pour la justice sociale est perpétuelle. Tout comme mes copains de classe, nous devons, tous et chacun, continuer à y travailler à vie. As you know, after several years of a law career, I concluded that my contribution to achieving a just society could best be achieved within the university, where I could, at least metaphorically, pursue all my erstwhile careers at once. So for 33 years, I've been lucky to be a pilot, a rocket scientist, a social activist, a researcher, and a teacher. Why, you might ask, am I reciting this ancient history? It's because I see in each of you, members of the class of 2008 at McGill University, a similar history to my own. And because I see in your class collectively the same enthusiasms that animated the class of 1972 at York University. The invention and reinvention of yourselves as you reflect on life's projects and possibilities. The passion, the commitment, the engagement with ideas and action, the outrage at injustice, the optimism that your efforts to achieve a more just world will bear fruit. You will each pursue your own careers in your own way, and each of you will have many such careers, I'm certain. Each of you will accomplish much, whether in New York, New Westminster, BC, Paris, Ontario, or Paris, France, whether in Montreal, Mombasa, Melbourne, or Mumbai. I can't express adequately what a privilege it is to have learned from you these past four years, to have been energized by your enthusiasms, to have watched you frame up and chase down your diverse ambitions. 
to have appreciated your affection for each other, and now to celebrate your triumph. But as we celebrate tonight, as we continue to pursue our dreams, let us not forget those who are not among our cohort. Life is not easy. To get this far, each one of you has confronted and surpassed several hurdles. Some have overcome physical limitations. Some, learning disabilities. Some, the streaming of a school system that does not always permit those with dreams and aspirations to flourish. Some, the grind of poverty or straightened economic circumstance. Some, the hazards and missteps in your youth. Some, the crush of inflated expectations of your parents, relatives, and siblings. Some, the disappointments of a failure to reach the lofty goals you've set for yourselves. But the key is this. You have overcome. You are here tonight, and you are still pursuing your dreams. The measure of a person is not where you start, nor even where you end up. The measure is in what you make of your life, what you do with the opportunities you've been given and the opportunities you strive to create for yourself. We ought never to forget the sobering words of Ecclesiasticus 44. Let us now praise famous men and our fathers that begat us, leaders of the people by their wise and eloquent counsels and by their knowledge of learning. All these were honored in their generations and were the glory of their times. But some there be which have no memorial, who are perished as though they had never been. These too were merciful men, whose righteousness hath not been forgotten. Their seed shall remain forever, and their glory shall not be blotted out. The message of Ecclesiasticus 44 is twofold. First, we're not placed in this world either to seek our own happiness or to chase awards and recognition. Much more deserving of public honors are those whose contribution to the lives of others has been quiet and personal. Mrs. Petey, the babysitter who nurtured my siblings and me over eight years. Mr. Puttifan, the auto mechanic who gave up his Friday nights to serve as the Aquila for the 239th Cub Pack in suburban Toronto. Miss Nectel, who for 45 years taught generations of youngsters about life, beauty, and self-discipline in the guise of weekly piano lessons. Deuxièmement, et finalement, voici le message clé que je veux passer ce soir. Chaque individu, chaque être de ce monde est doté du potentiel de vivre une vie vertueuse. Il faut imaginer toute personne comme un fin en soi et non pas comme un simple moyen de réaliser nos propres fins. Réussir et obtenir la reconnaissance de ses pairs ne sont pas la preuve d'une vie bien vécue. Ce sont des jalons purement transitoires et éphémères. Notre vertu se manifeste par nos actes et nos croyances, telles que sont reflétées dans les vies vertueuses de ceux et celles qui nous rencontrons au long de notre vie et qui vivent vertueusement après notre mort. I'd like to conclude my reflection with a song written 40 years ago. Phil Oakes was a sensitive and a vulnerable poet, writer of popular songs, who when inspiration dried up, began to drink heavily, and in one moment of despondency, killed himself. Before he did, however, he penned an extraordinary call to action, an anthem to engagement. The song which many of you may remember from the administrative process course is entitled, When I'm Gone. I hope you carry its message with you for the rest of your careers. For the moment, however, let me congratulate you all on your magnificent achievement. Find me singing out this song when I'm gone. 
So I guess I'll have to do it. Oh dear. And I won't feel the flowing of the time when I'm gone. All the pleasures of love, they won't be mine when I'm gone. My pen won't pour a lyric line when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to I won't breathe the brand air when I'm gone. Can't even worry about my cares when I'm gone. Won't be asked to do my share when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it when I'm here. And I won't be running from the rain when I'm gone. Can't even suffer from the pain. Nothing I can lose or even gain when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it. And I won't see the golden of the sun when I'm gone. All the evenings and mornings will be one when I'm gone. Can't be singing louder than the guns when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. All my days, they won't be dances of delight when I'm gone. Sounds will be shifting from my sight when I'm gone. Can't add my name to the fight when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to go when I'm here. And I won't be laughing at their lies when I'm gone. Can't question how or when or why when I'm gone. Can't live proud enough to die when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it all here. There's no place in this world where I belong and I'm gone. And I won't know the right from the wrong when I'm gone. You won't find me singing out this song when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to.